I want to welcome you to the Bible Study to Know Christ. I'm Jeff Peterson, the pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining me as we continue our series on the Beatitudes. And so as we begin, let's join in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word and the opportunity to be able to read it and to study it, but also, Lord, to experience your Holy Spirit and helping us to grow in our word that we may come to love you more and more in our lives. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the promise of your heavenly kingdom, your heavenly kingdom that dwells in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, but also the promise that one day we will live in the new creation for which you have prepared. And so be with us now. We ask you to open up our hearts and our minds that we may hear your word and to receive it and to grow from it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Beatitudes are a collection of Jesus' saying, you know, where each one of these is, is a Beatitude, a blessing that God gives to us, and so they're recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And so I'll read. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are you, are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends the reading. And so beatitude is God's ultimate blessing. And so we see now God's ultimate blessing and that he has blessed us with the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven that has come to us in Jesus Christ. And that is the kingdom of heaven that has come into this world is Jesus. And as we receive Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ enters into our lives, he makes claim upon us. And so God's kingdom is established in us. And together, for the believers, we are the church. So if people are looking for the kingdom of heaven in this world, it is the church. That is where God has made his claim. And so the kingdom has, is with us. And so we wonder, well, how close is the kingdom to us? Jesus says it is so close that, is, that it is within you. But we must also remember, though, that God's kingdom has been established in this world, within our hearts. But also he has promised to us the kingdom of heaven, that when we die, we will enter in a new place. And so all of God's word talks about the kingdom of heaven that we may dwell with our Lord forever. Whether it's in a passage or a verse or in the whole Bible, I think about Psalm 23 that is so popular that so many people know, but what is at the end of Psalm 23? The promise that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I mean, this gladdens our hearts. That as we read through the word, that God continues to reinforce and to remind us and to say that I have blessed you with the kingdom, that you may dwell in my house forever. Even as we read at the end of the Bible, as we read in Revelation, what is Jesus talking about? 
he's referring to the kingdom. This place where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering anymore, and that Jesus himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And so we must remember that God, God has created our lives and that it is not just some dismal, meaningless, purposeless life that we are living, but rather we are journeying. That creation and life is heading somewhere. It's journeying for eternal life, for salvation. And I think that's the problem with today is that the people aren't hearing the good news, and so they're wondering, oh, what is life all about? What is my purpose? Is there any purpose in this life? Is it heading toward any, any, anything? You know, people may, all they may hear is just gloom and doom. The forecast for today, for today is not good. And so whatever kind of a forecast you're looking for, a forecast, an economic forecast, for instance, you know, sometimes it's not always a good one. And so people think, what is my purpose? What is my meaning? Especially when they've been without work for a long time. Whereas life is not going well, saying, you know, my life is like a spinning Merry ground that is going so fast that everything about my life seems to be flying off of it. Well, people may say, be saying, I've lost my marriage. I've lost my kids. I've lost my dignity. And we're more and more where people are saying that life, all there is now is just to get a bottle of booze and to get drunk. And what little hope that I may have, it may be in the casino. That maybe I could put a couple of coins in the machine, slop out, and have some hope for the future. And that's the message that humanity is giving. Party, get drunk, play the slots. That maybe you can have a little fun as your merry-go-round continues to accelerate and as you continue to, to lose whatever you have. Because what the world is saying is that there is no future. And the news that we may receive is so bleak because we're living in a society that has given up on God. A society that doesn't want to hear about God. And so we may put a little trust or hope in the economic future. We may put our trust in a politician, thinking that this one person or maybe this political party can get everything all shaped up and get us going down the right track. Well, if we are a nation that has turned its back on God, you could, you could raise Abraham Lincoln from the dead, but it's not going to do any good until our nation repents. A nation that repents is a nation that turns its eyes to God, is a nation that's going to go strong. But here again, if a nation has turned its back on God, you can bring back all of the great political leaders and it's not going to do any good. So where do we put our hope? Where do we put our trust? The Bible's message is that you put it in God and your life is heading towards something. Your life is filled with hope. The future is bright. God has given to you the great beatitude. That in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. And so I read from John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is arisen. The Holy Spirit has come and the Holy Spirit fills our hearts. The Holy Spirit transforms our, our life. The Holy Spirit comes in and the Holy Spirit gives us a radiant hope to trust and to believe all of what Jesus has done for us. And that's what you need to be in contact with is the Holy Spirit. I mean, but Jesus gives us that beautiful promise once again. In my Father's house there are many rooms and I go and prepare a place for you. And why does he do this? Because God wants to be in relationship with you. Always enjoy verse 3. He does all this so that where I am, there you may be too. God is not a God that just created and now left, but rather God is a God who is very personal. God wants a relationship with you now and forever. And Jesus goes and he prepares a place for us and he does that by dying on a cross for us. I mean, how powerful that is. The length and the degree for which God will go in his love. So we may always be together. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This all has to do with righteousness. That he is the way, that he is the right path. You know, going places, we're always traveling, whether it be in our vehicles or, or on a hike or canoeing down a river. You know, whatever it is, you're going somewhere, we're always traveling, even if it's across town. But if we need to go somewhere, there hopefully is a way to get there. And we will find that way. And there is that right way to get there. Jesus is the right way. Jesus is the righteous one. Jesus is the truth. Truth, that is the basis for where we measure everything. Right from wrong. About creation, where it all comes from and where it's all going. The basis of what sets us right when we realize that we have been wronged, when we are wrong. The truth is to say that we are now right with God. And the life that Jesus is the righteous one is not by filling our lives, trying to fill up our lives with materialistic things or with money. with all the things of the world, like I've said in other studies, to say that, you know, you can fill up your whole life with, with the world, but that will not have the power to save you. That's why Jesus says, what will it profit a person to gain the whole world, but yet fall short of the glory of God? You can fill your life up with the whole world, and you know what? You're still going to be searching. You're still going to be hungering and thirsting for what it is that can satisfy your life. That life is not summed up with how high you get or how drunk you got the night before. It's more and more that's how people define life. Is how, did, how is my drunk? And they will talk about it. I hear people. I, I'll go into places and I'll be hearing about people. They'll be talking about you know, how they got drunk. And they were proud of it. They brag about it and basically saying, my drunk was really good. Now I look forward to the next one as their life spirals down. But the righteousness is that Jesus is the life. And until we come to know Jesus, we're not living we're going through this life and we're missing it. You know, I was visiting with some people the other day and they were just talking about how people are just trying to get away with things. Trying to get away with going to work and 
trying to do the minimum, and trying to get away with not doing this and not doing that, but still hoping to get their paycheck. How do we, you know, the attitude is, how do I put in a minimal effort but get a maximum output? In other words, how do I get away with life? You know, God puts you in this world not to get away with life, but rather to put into life all that you can. You know, wouldn't it be sad to go through all your whole life and then to look back on it and say, I missed out on it? Just think of all of what I could have done, or I missed out on it because I didn't know Jesus? I mean, that's the truth about, and the righteousness is knowing Jesus, that we are living life in the reality for which God has created us. And so, as we look at this passage, heaven is our home. That is our destination. But in the meantime, we are sojourning through this life. And this life is not always easy. And that there is persecution in this world but Jesus says, but blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. For this righteousness. Being persecuted because of Jesus. And so when you're pre persecuted, you are being persecuted for one reason and one reason only. Because you are standing for Jesus. And so you're, you know, some people may be persecuted, but you have to understand is that... You know, some people may be persecuted because of their political stances. Or because they are living eccentrically. They're getting underneath people's skin. Well, that's not the kind of persecution that we're talking about here. You're being persecuted for one reason, and that is because of Jesus. And that if it wasn't for Jesus, the whole world would not be picking on you. It would be leaving you alone. And so what I say about that, living an eccentric lifestyle, you know, I have seen where people think that they are doing the work of Christ. As they will go into a crowd, and they'll have a sign that says, you better turn to Jesus, otherwise you're going to hell. And they'll have a blowhorn, and as people are saying, they're yelling in their ears, and they're being a nuisance. Well, this person has to realize that they're not being persecuted because of Jesus. They're being persecuted because they're being annoying. And they're not bringing people to Jesus. Their witness is such that, if anything, they're driving people away from Jesus. I mean, if you take a bullhorn and a whip amongst a herd of cattle, and you start whipping them, you know what? Those cattle are going to run. And so if you go into a crowd of people with your horn, your bull whip, and your sign, you know what? They're going to run away from Jesus. And so don't be thinking that if you, as people are making fun of you and are harassing you, that somehow that your reward is great in heaven. No, you're driving people away from Christ. It's not the kind of witness that Jesus wants us to be doing. And so, you know, we hear about persecution. I hear people say, oh, I've been persecuted. That word is so used so loosely. Well, what do we mean by persecution? Okay, well, for everybody's benefit, I will divide it into three ways. Okay, I'll say that one will be being teased. That that is a level of persecution. Where somebody is putting you down or making fun of you because you're a Christian. And I know, I'm not saying that adults don't experience this, but I know a lot of youth will share with me that as they are trying to live a Christian life at school or, or amongst their friends that they get teased quite a bit. And so that would be a form of persecution. And so if you're being laughed at today as you're living the Christian life, you know, that would be a mild form of persecution. A, a second level would be that as you're living the Christian life that you're actually being punished for that. That you're being discriminated against because you are a Christian. If you weren't a Christian, there would be no discrimination. But because you're a Christian, there's discrimination. Or that if you get beaten or imprisoned, punished in these ways, that that would be a level of persecution. And then the third would be when you are being put to death because you are a Christian. And so, you know, in our society today, thankfully, and I'm not saying that the day won't come 
But right now I'd say that most of us probably are at that, that first level of persecution. Maybe in some ways we could be at that second level. I don't know how many people in the United States are being put to death today because they are Christian. I know that there are some places in our world today where there are Christians who are being put to death. But when you think about that word persecution, you better think about it. Now, you know, when you're going around saying, well, I've been persecuted, well, think about it, especially when there are those who have been put to death because of the name of Jesus. You know, I may be in that first level of persecution, but sometimes I don't like to use that word persecution because that's nothing compared to what a lot of Christians throughout history or even today are going through. And so as we think about the Christian message, blessed are they who suffer or who are persecuted for Jesus' name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so as I think about just Christians, I know a lot of Christians where they will practice their Christianity at Christmas and at Easter. So in other words, you know, for the most part, is that they're there at the beginning of the story and they are there at the end of the story. Because the beginning of the story is kind of nice and the end of the story is, kind of, is really nice. And so everybody wants to be part of that. Everybody wants to be a Christian. I mean, when you look at Christmas, oh, people say, isn't that a sentimental time? Oh, it just gives me a warm feeling. And so I like to be a sentimental Christian. I just love to go to church on Christmas Eve and hear all the beautiful songs and, and carols and to be able to see the lights. Ooh, it just, it's lovely. Then Easter, well, who doesn't want to wake up on Easter morning and hear the good news that Jesus Christ is arisen and salvation and an eternal life is yours? Well, who doesn't want to hear that? But it's in between. It's in between. That's where we don't want to hear about it. We all love, you know, the blessing that you may inherit the kingdom of heaven. We all want to be part of that. It's kind of like rooting for a ball team just before they're going to win the Super Bowl or the World Series. We all want to jump on the bandwagon because we all want to have a piece of that victory. We all want to have a claim on the prize. We want that reward. You know, we want the reward of heaven, but we just don't want to hear what is said. We don't want to hear about how Herod tried to kill Jesus before he was two years of age. We don't want to hear about that. We don't want to hear about how Jesus was rejected by his own hometown. We don't want to hear about how Jesus was, was rejected by the religious leaders, the high priest, you know, the, the, the religious sects such as the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. We don't want to hear about how Jesus was <clears throat> betrayed by his own disciples. We don't want to hear about how Jesus was arrested and how he was brutally beaten, whipped, and the loss of blood and the pain. We don't want to hear about how the crowd was demanding to the governor, Pilate, who was, Jesus, who was the, the judge at Jesus' trial. We don't want to hear about how they were demanding that Jesus be crucified. We don't, you know, we don't want to hear about how Jesus died on a cross. We just don't want to hear about that stuff. And if we hear about that stuff, then maybe it's going to make us face life. The pains in the world. We don't want to hear about the starving children in Somalia. We don't want to hear about the earthquake victims in Japan. You know, we don't want to be faced with our own suffering and pain. We'd rather just eat, drink, and be merry hoping that we can have some fun in life. But what does Jesus say to those who follow? If we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, that Jesus says, that if anyone come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and to follow me. And so what does it mean to pick up our, our cross? Well, first of all, it means that we have received the salvation of Jesus Christ. That what Jesus has done, and it's both Good Friday and Easter, Jesus' death and his resurrection, I have claimed that. But also it means to be his witness that I will proclaim 
Jesus' death and resurrection for other people. And I will not be ashamed of the gospel. I will proclaim his message with boldness. To pick up the cross means is that we will serve. We will serve the causes of Christ. We will be helping those who are in need. We will be helping the Christ in our midst. It means that we will stand for justice and peace, knowing that without justice we won't have peace. And that we will work to help our neighbor and to be continually working, building up relationships so that we are going the opposite direction of war. You know, war happens when we fail to be working on building relationships. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing even though it's not politically correct, even though it's not uh, popular with our friends, even though it may not work to our advantage. You know, I think about Daniel and his friends in the Bible and how they were persecuted for doing the right thing. I think about Polycarp, an early church bishop who was burned at the stake because he continued to believe in Jesus Christ. I think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer who, who was persecuted in Germany because he stood against Hitler in the whole Nazi regime. If we carry the cross of Christ, living our lives in this world which aren't always pleasing, bearing Christ's name, but knowing that in the end, our reward is great in heaven. Well, thank you for joining me. Join me again next week as we continue our study to know Christ. Coming to our area, Rebecca St. James. Grammy Award winner Rebecca St. James, Sunday, October 30th at 6.30. Also appearing for King and Country and singer Danan Kane. Inheritance is ours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ticket sales begin September 30th through the UW Platteville Center for the Arts box office. Call 608-342-1298. On behalf of the Lutheran Church of Peace, I'm Robert Snyder. Thank you for watching our program, and please join us again for To Know Christ.